Okay, we better, better get on here a little earlier. Well, we are Okay, guys, we are rolling along. We have about 30 seconds. So what we're going to do is move forward. I thank God you guys are joining us here today. Prayerfully, something will be said that will be beneficial to you. So let me remove the church and thank God for you that taking time from your busy schedules to be here with me. Be here with me today for Bible study. Saints, I pray that you grasp this to your heart, that you may sit down and listen to what's being said and find out what is in it that you can say, okay, this happened to Paul, but I can see a similarity to something that is taking place in my life or around me that we can take the Bible and make it live. That's what I often say, guys. You have to make the word live. Find out how this pertains to you today or it, or else it just become dead paper, um, where in that case, um, with dead writing on paper. And we know that the word of God is not dead. It's a lie. It's alive in us. So what we're going to do is we're going to go forward as we always do. Let's pray, saints, and that God, we may um, step out of the natural into the spiritual and by letting the spirit of God have his way and bless him that he may be able to take over and teach us what we need to learn in his word for this moment. So with that said, let us go before the throne of grace. Father. We thank you, we bless you, and we honor you for this day. We thank you for who you are and for everything that you have done thus far, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you bless us, Lord God, that we may stay in the moment right here, right now, that we may hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say unto the body. Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus that you come visit us right now, that you may take the helm, Lord, that you may show us some of the deep secrets of your word, something that we did not see, Lord. I pray, Lord, that I do my job and stay in the moment. But I pray and believe by faith, Lord, that you would do yours, Lord, and teach thy people something that they need. Now, I don't know what it is that the saints have been facing and going through and dealing with today, but I assure, Lord God, I assure them that you have something to say to them, for them, about them, via your word, Lord. So I pray that we stay focused in the moment, Lord, help the saints to remove <clears throat> every distraction that they may be facing at this moment, Lord. So help us to silence phones. Help us, Lord God, to cut off TVs or whatever need be done, Lord, that we may be able to give ear to the Spirit to hear what he have to say. I pray, Lord, that they set their minds to give me 40, 45 minute max that we may be able to get into the word together to study thy word, the depths of it and grow. Now, right now, by my own free will, I give the power of attorney to this message to the Holy Spirit that he may freely speak to thy people, meet them where they're at, Lord God, to those that are here right now, help us to stay focused and in a moment, that's our responsibility. And we believe by faith that we do our job, you would do yours, Lord, by blessing us with the word that will deliver us through. To those that are being, those that are in route, to get to a safe place where they are able to hear the message, Lord, and apply it to their lives. I plead the blood of Jesus, Lord, that you may bless them, protect them from the dangers all around them, that they may get to a safe place, Lord, that they may be able to view the message, Lord, and grow into those that will not be here with us tonight for whatever reason. I plead the blood of Jesus, Lord, that they may go back to view this message at a later date, that they may find out everything that you have in it for them, for their spiritual growth. So with that said and done, Lord God, I plead the blood of Jesus by binding every demonic spirit that raises up, Lord, with the purpose of causing thy saints any kind of trouble, Lord Jesus, binding those spirits in Jesus' name that we may be able to stay focused on the word. Help me to stay in the moment and we'll forever give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. Now, if you do this for us, Lord, we'll be so careful to glorify thy name. Now, this is a prayer we ask the Holy Spirit to deliver to the Father for it is both in the name and under the blood of our Lord and our Savior. For you are Jesus. You are the Christ. Amen. And so we want to thank you, saints, for taking time for going with us in Bible study. So we're going to um, pick up what we left off um, in the book of Acts, the 25th chapter. Now, what we want to do is do our ever popular slingshot effect. We're going to go back and rehearse what we studied last week. And then we're going to move to new information this week. And I pray that you remember these things and find out what is it that God gave you last week. Maybe something that may jar you the way you were able to uh, remember those things and be able to grow. So we studied um, last week. We was in... Acts the 25th chapter, and it was about the 12th verse um, on down. So we're going to read 12 to, I think it's like 15, no, 12 to 18, 17. And then we're going to uh, lightly touch on that, and then we're going to go with new information. So this is what it was saying in Acts um, 25th chapter, verse number 12. It says, Then Festus, when he, had, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Has thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar thou shalt go. 
And after, and after certain days, when King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus, and when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's case unto, king, unto the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix, about whom when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him, to whom I answered, it is not the manner of Rome to deliver any man to death before that he which is accused have the accuser face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning, concerning the crime lied against him. Therefore, when they were come hither without delay on, on, on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth. Now, what we had studied here and a couple of things that we was pointing out to us, we know what was taking place that um, um, Paul, when he was sitting and listening at the situation and saw how the Jews were trying to set him up, they started out by try, first trying to have um, Festus to, to send him to Jerusalem so they could kill him along the way. But Festus didn't want to go along with that because Festus is like, oh, look, we at Rome have uh, an order the way we do things. We're not going to send a man to death without being, uh, without facing his accusers and be able to answer for himself the accusations made against him. And so Festus, and when he had said that, Paul listening to what was said, Festus wanted to know, okay, would you be willing to go to Ju uh, Jerusalem to have this matter heard? But Paul said, no, it happened right here, so I'm going to appeal to Caesar. So Festus asked him, well, then are you saying uh, are you saying you want to exercise your right to be heard in the Roman court system? And he said, yes, that's that's what I want. That's what I want. So at this time, the Jewish um, leaders, the religious people, and uh, the chief priest and all of them knew the gig was up. They knew the gig was up. They would, um, He's going to get to Rome, which means his case is going to be heard. But if they would have let, if Festus would have let him or if Festus, Paul would have taken the deal where he was able to go up to Jerusalem, they would have killed him along the way so there wouldn't have been a trial. That would have been a, if you would, kind of, it could have been for Festus an easy out. But it would have also been a problem that a Roman citizen was killed. So Festus was pretty much between a rock and a hard place. I told you, the only thing that Rome desired from his province is two things. One, that there is peace. Two, to get the taxes. Or one, get the taxes. And two, that there be peace. And so that's what every Jewish governor wanted. They wanted to keep the peace that they would not be reported to Caesar that they may say in your province is out of control, you're not able to handle this, so you're going to be demoted. None of them wanted that. But and when you're dealing in Jerusalem and the Jews, they had a lot of customs and laws and things of that sort. So it was hard for an average person or a Gentile to keep up with all of these laws and what's broken and what's problems here. And that's the whole thing that was taking place that was going on. So Festus says, okay, this whole situation, I'm going to keep this man, protect him, until he goes to Caesar, which he has requested. Okay? So that I brought you guys up to speed to what was taking place and uh, what has been going on. Okay. So, now, we go into verse number 18, okay? Verse number 18, where we go into new information, it says, in verse number 18, it says, against whom when the accusers stood up, they brought non-accusations non of such things, I suppose. So, what had taken place was Festus had set the situation, uh, set the scene. He brought the accusers along with the accused, and he listened to the story. He, um, Paul was more than able to answer for himself. As I said, when you speak truth, you don't have to wonder what you're going to say. You don't have to wonder if you ask the thing again and again. When you speak truth, truth going to keep saying the same thing. But the problem they had was when their time to speak you can see right there when it came to their time to speak with all this they they have tried. They have tried. They they matter of fact they made the accusations against the man before Felix even got to got to his place. Before he even got to Caesarea. They was in Jerusalem making uh, accusing Paul. And then they went from there, um, came to Caesarea and accusing Paul. Felix tried to Festus tried to work with this whole situation, but when they came up to speak. Again, in verse number 18, it says, against whom 
against whom when the accusers stood up, they brought no, ac no accusations of such things as I suppose. So he's saying, okay, you guys did all of this trying to have this man killed. I'm giving you a chance to make the case for why he should be killed. And y'all not even talking about nothing that's pertaining to this. What in the world? You know, one thing that um, my wife and, and I do, because she does a lot with Facebook, you, I um, many times I'm looking at, or uh, a lot with YouTube, I'm looking a lot at YouTube and looking at things, and they have this thing which they call clickbait. Meaning, clickbait will show you something that's there, and it captures your attention. There's always something um, wow, and it, it's trying to force you to click on to go to that channel or to go to that um, or to look in that situation, only to find that when you click into it, that it's nothing to do. It has nothing to do with what you're talking about. That's what Festus is saying right here. I'm giving you guys an opportunity to speak on this matter and to say why is it this man should be murdered or killed. Now, when it comes time for you guys to make your case, y'all talking about something out in left field. See, that's what happens when you don't have truth on your side. You're just trying to keep a conversation instead of dealing with the matter. But Paul was able to address the matter head on because that's what Paul was saying. I think it was back in verse number... Um, but Paul... Okay, no, I'm, I'm thinking it back. Okay, there it's... Okay, in verse number eight. See, when Paul, go back to verse number eight. Look at verse number eight, and Paul says, he says, while he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offended any man. So have I offended, uh, have I offended anybody? So what you're finding when you're looking at Paul, when he had an opportunity, he went straight to the matter. See, when you are telling the truth, when somebody is making an accusation against you and you are speaking the truth, you go straight to the heart of the matter because you have a confidence in what you're saying because you know what the truth is. And when you know what the truth is, you're not bothered. I don't want to get no fluffy stuff. I want to get straight to the issue. Let's deal with it. But you notice when you don't have truth, these guys went somewhere out in left field. And Festus was like, ah, what? Y'all ain't even addressing what I thought y'all was here for. And so those are the things that you will find. Always have truth with you guys because you were able to answer the question head on. But when you find someone that's ducking and dodging and hooing and hawing all around, you know that person is not speaking truth, guys. Or because the thing is they're trying to think of something to say. But when you know the truth, you don't have to think of anything to say. You just say it. And you don't worry about what you say because if you ask me again, I'm able to say the same thing again. Even if you ask me 30 minutes, an hour from now, why is that? Because the truth always stand firm. The truth always stand firm. And so that's what Festus was asking him, y'all. And so he's telling him, this thing, y'all not even talking about what we should. He says, he says, but in verse number 19, he says, but had certain questions against him of their own superstitions and of, and of one Jesus, which was dead whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Okay, here's what we're dealing with here, saints. You are looking at a natural man dealing with spiritual matters. That is what's taking place right there. And that's why he says, but but had certain questions against, against him of their own superstition. So he said, I thought you guys was to deal with this. You didn't. But y'all immediately start dealing with super, y'all religious stuff. Y'all religious stuff. That's what the whole crux of the matter was. Remember, I think it was back. I'm not sure, guys. I'm a, I'm a, I'm just jumping the water right here and see can I find. Um, okay, I think it was in verse number. Okay, just going. I think it was in verse number in, in chapter 24. In chapter 24, that everything was fine, but Paul addressed the issue. It's touching the matter of the resurrection that caused y'all this problem. See, y'all started acting crazy when I dealt with that. Everything Paul had been said, they was listening to him very intently and closely. But the moment he touched the resurrection, saying Jesus is alive, that's when they begin to go into, you know, they really begin to act out. And that's what's taking place prevalent in your life. The devil is okay with you being religious. 
But when you touch the resurrection of the dead, meaning when you say Jesus is alive, now how will you say Jesus is alive? He's alive in you because the things that was dead in you, he has brought a light. He has brought to life. The way that you used to act, Jesus will change that way that you act. The things you used to say, Jesus will change the things that you say. The things you used to do, Jesus will change the things you used to do. Because this thing is about your mind. When Jesus get into your mind and change your mind, it will change your actions. But what is taking place is you have a lot of people that has Jesus still on the cross. You see people walk around with that Jesus piece on their neck. And that's where he is in their lives. Still on the cross and dead. But when you have a live Jesus that's resurrection, and my thing is, I would rather have not the cross, but have the stone that's rolled away. Because once that's rolled away, that is Jesus at life. But you have so many believers still have the dead Jesus they're walking around with. And yet where you won't find him making no difference in their life. That way you won't find no difference in their speaking. That way there's no difference in their thinking. That's because Jesus to them is dead. Because a living Jesus is not going to allow you to think the way you want to think. Speak the way you want to speak. Act the way you want to act. That's not going to go down with a living Jesus. Because you was bought with a price. And he's going to arrange things, in, rearrange things in his house the way he wants them. And when you try to put things back in place, Jesus is going to move them and say, no longer. That's not longer. That's no longer you. As the word says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The problem is you got a lot of believers that's walking after their flesh. They still doing the things that they once did. Still going the way that they used to go. Still acting the way that they used to act. Because Jesus is on the cross in their life as opposed to Jesus that has risen from the dead. Do you not know that Jesus on the cross could not do much for you? He had to die and be descended down into hell, release those that were captive, raise the third day. And when he raised, he had the keys to both heaven, hell, and the grave. And now he has the authority to move things in your life. But the problem is you have many, so many Christians still like this, that Jesus on the cross. And that's what Festus was looking at. In verse number 19, he says, but he but has certain questions against him of their superstition. The Jews was looking for the Messiah. They just couldn't accept them. They couldn't accept the fact that he had come. Are you still looking for Jesus to come when Jesus have already came? Are you still waiting on Jesus to display his power when he has already given you the authority? Why is it that you find yourself in this manner? What is it that you find yourself doing? Why is this thing going on in your life this way? They reach out to John Tate. And so that's what you will find right there. So he's saying here, no, y'all talking about y'all superstitions of one Jesus, which is which was dead. But Paul said he's alive. Now, my question to you is, where are you at? See, Festus being a Festus being a, a, a Jew, I'm going to say being a Roman, think this stuff is just silly. So Festus saying this is just crazy, then you're looking and saying, no, this Jesus is dead. But these people are upset because he's saying he's alive. Now, here's my question. By you claiming Jesus is alive, do it make people upset? Or people already see the Jesus that you serve is still dead on the cross? And so, and so what you will find in that situation, there is your situation. He is saying it's superstitious. To people, your belief is superstitious to them. Meaning they put in no more than a trinket of everything else, lumping it with all of the other religions. I told you the difference between Christianity and everything else, those are religion. They preach religion. We preach salvation. And salvation is for the living. Religion is of the dead. And so that's what you're looking at. The argument Festus is pointing to, they don't got all upset. They all in a tizzy because they're talking about their superstitions and they're talking about one Jesus, which is dead. But Paul saying they're alive. If he's crazy, let him be crazy. Festus is saying, what y'all so upset about? But a dead Jesus can't move anything. But a living Jesus can move everything. Now, let me ask you a question. Is he alive or is he dead in your life? Do you have him on the cross or do you see the stone that's rolled away? And if you find yourself with the Jesus that's with the stone that is rolled away, you will then find that God will then begin to move in your life. The problem is you got so many Christians that refuse to let Jesus get off the cross. 
That means they refuse to let them be resurrected in their life. They choose their lifestyle more than they choose righteousness. But when he rolled away that stone, guys, let me tell you something. There is something new that came out of that tomb. That was the dead that was in them, but the new walked out of there. So my question to you is, are you still on the cross? Or have Jesus resurrected you and you walking out of the tomb? That's what we have. And so they're saying the argument is Jesus. And that's what Paul addressed back in, in uh, chapter 24, the last part of chapter 24. He's touching the resurrection of the dead that got them upset. And that's what uh, Festus is saying. I don't understand what you're all arguing about. That's because Festus is looking at a spiritual matter through natural eyes. And he's not going to understand. But you are dealing with, as I say many times, you're not dealing with a face, a place, or a voice. What you had, the Jewish and the religious leaders were being ran by demons that was trying to stop Jesus from delivering and setting people free. And you have demons that are fighting you for trying to proclaim the name of Jesus in your life, around people in your family, around people in your neighborhood, around people on your job. The devil wants you to have a silent Jesus. But a resurrected Jesus is not silent. He speaks and he speaks loudly. That is to say, saints, you ought to walk up right before God and honor him in the manner that you should, that you will find that God can then begin to work in the life of the sick people around you, around the people that's sick in the mind, people that's sick in heart, people that's natural and spiritual sickness. God has, God has um, a cure for all of them, be it natural or be it physical. Be it natural or spiritual, God has an answer for the sickness that man is dealing with. You have that answer. It is the living Jesus Christ. See, people want Jesus in different various forms. They want him as little bitty baby Jesus. I can hold him and control him. They want him as dead Jesus. You can't tell me what to do. But they do not want him as the living Jesus. Because then, the resurrected Jesus. They don't want him as the resurrected Jesus. Because the living Jesus, before he went on the cross, could only be in one place at one time. But the resurrected Jesus can be everywhere at the same time. And so that's what you're beginning to deal with here. It says, and because I doubted of such matters, this verse number 20, because I doubted of such matters of questions, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. So Festus is saying, look, I don't know nothing about this. I don't know nothing about y'all religion. I don't know nothing about this superstitious stuff y'all talking about. So are you willing to go up there that if you're innocent, the people that know this would say you're innocent and therefore they would, you know, do away with this. But Paul knew what the gig was. No, if you get me in Jerusalem, the same Pharisees that's here trying to get me killed here, you just have all of them there. So I assure you it's going to be a kangaroo court if I go to Jerusalem. So he's saying, no, 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 no. And, and that's what Paul was saying, no. In the house of um, in Caesar, uh, that's what I'm appealing to because that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. So that's what he was saying is I'm asking you. And so Festus is telling King Agrippa, this is what I was saying, man. Do you want to go there where people know what they're talking? Because I have no idea with this right here. I can't judge much on a matter that I don't know about. All I know is what I'm hearing. And so far what I'm hearing, I don't see you have a problem. Well, Paul is okay. You don't have to know everything. All you need to know is they are saying this. I'm saying this. You're listening to it. You have common sense. You know when someone is lying. When you're listening to two stories, you know what don't sound right. And you know which one sounds, okay, like this is on. This right here seems to make sense. And so that's what he was saying. Again, in verse number 20, he says, because I doubted of such matters, of such matter of questioning, manner of questioning, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and be judged. Of them of these matters. And Paul said, of course, and won't. No, I'm not going. I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to plant mine right here and stay right here. This is what it's going to go down. Matter of fact, I'm going to take it out of your hands. I'm appealing to Caesar. And so now Festus' hands is tied. It says, it says, but when Paul had appealed to be reserved until the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept, kept till I might see seeing him to Caesar. So what he's saying is, that, now remember, um, Festus is talking to King Agrippa and he's telling King Agrippa this whole matter, what is taking place. 
And he's saying, I, you know, I asked him, did he want to go down? What, what um, Festus is saying is, well, this is a situation that did not talk about what I thought they were going to talk about. I had no understanding of their these religious beliefs. I asked Paul, did he want to go there to be um, to be judged? Somebody who knew what they was talking about, he refused it, and so now um, he's gonna. I have to protect him until he's sent sent to Caesar. See, remember, Festus was saying the Roman creed was we're not gonna um, allow a person to be in any way, form, or fashion. Judge without having a fair say or executed without a fair say. And that's what he was saying. It's not our manner to let a man be, you know, to be dead, ex except he have the accuser and himself to be able to make his accusation or make his um, stand his case. And so everywhere around, Paul is winning this thing. And the Jewish leaders know it. They have no ground to stand on. And Festus is even quickly understood. This has nothing to do with what y'all are saying. This is bigger. It's a spiritual matter that we have taking place, saints. It's a spiritual matter. It says, Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear this, hear this man myself. Tomorrow, he said, thou shalt hear him. So it, the case was intriguing. The case was very intriguing to Agrippa. And Agrippa says, you know what? You have the chief priests and the elders coming down here to have this man dead. This man is able to make a fair showing for himself why he is not guilty. The people I'm asking him, do you ask him, do he want to go up there to fight for his case? He appeals to Caesar. And you got to protect him. Until he gets to Caesar. Yeah, I think I want to hear this case. I want to hear exactly what is going down here. So I can make my own judgment of this matter. Remember, Festus is a Roman. And Roman, they don't have a king. They have a Caesar. And what they have is all of these. Uh, Festus is a governor, if you will. A governor over a province. Now, Agrippa is the king. Over this whole situation, over the Jew, so he's well, he's well aware of the Jewish customs. Why? Because he's a Jew, and so he's sitting there and he's listening to all of this, and he's saying, "Okay, I know Jewish customs, I know this, so let me hear this case. I am curious as to what's going down here." And that's what he's saying. And he said, well, "Okay, tomorrow you're gonna get to hear this firsthand. I don't told you all that I can tell you tomorrow." I want you to hear firsthand. Okay, it says here, and then uh, verse 23, it says, And on the morrow, when Agrippa, uh, when Agrippa was come, and Bernice with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captain and principal men of the city, at Festus' command, Paul was brought forth. Okay, let's exegete this so we can break it down. It's a lot in this right here, this verse. Okay, it says, Now the next day, um, when King Agrippa came, and Bernice, with great pomp. See, now remember, King Agrippa, when a king came into an area, there was a huge entourage with him. He did not just go by himself. So there's a huge entourage, armor bearers, protectors, all of these that came in, and Bernice right there with them. So they come in, and all of this is going on. The Festus is already, already there. There's going to be a big trial. You had also the chief captain and so uh, great religious people there, the chief captain and principal men. So when a uh, king comes into a city, you always have others that come out. Like I said, if the president comes to um, North Carolina, and let's say he comes to where I'm at in North Carolina is Winston-Salem. So if the president comes to Winston-Salem, well, what you're going to have, you're going to have the mayor of Winston. You're going to have the, you're going to have the governor of um, North Carolina. You're going to have the Congress people of North Carolina. You're going to have senators of North Carolina. All of them are coming in along because the president, someone of great power and authority coming in. So all of these people are going to come too. So you're going to have a lot of very powerful people in one area. Not only that, now the religious leaders are there. So you have the natural, you have the spiritual, all of them are there, and you have the man of God standing right there to be judged. 
and Rome is sitting right here looking at all of this. So that's what you got going on in verse number 23. The next day, that's what it says, and on the, mor and on the morrow, which is the next day, when Agrippa was come and Bernice with great pomp, that means great um, pomp and circumstances. What do they call that when you have all of the people um, coming out? Very gaudy, very a big shindig, a lot to do about nothing. Horns blowing, people stopping. Who is that? Huh? What? That's my, that's, that's my brain. So what we have, guys, is you have all of these, um, all this is going on. And you said, so all of these pompous circumstances going on. It says, and was entered into the place, place of the hearing. So all of this is going into, if you would, the courtroom. So it's like a who's who in the courtroom. And you have them from all angles, from the natural, from the, from the, um, the governor of, from Rome to the Jewish, to the, the, the priest, to, to the, the mighty man, and Paul. And let me tell you this, guys. This is how this applies to you today. All these people of power, imagine that. You have, um, if you was to take and put them in the places of authority, it would have been at the top, which would have been Festus, because Rome ran it all. And then King Agrippa. And then you had his cabinet. And then you had the chief priest. And then you had all of the other mighty men of the city. And then you had just Paul standing there and all of this. Hey, you plus Jesus is the majority. So you just stand with Jesus and no matter how great or how what name a person carry, you are able to stand up in the midst of all those people and not be worried. Because God says, he that is with you is greater than those that are against you. So don't you worry about their titles and what they carry. You just know that God loves you and will defend you. And so that's what it says. Now, all of them are in the place. They're in the courtroom. It says, and Festus says, King Agrippa and all men which are here present with us. Ye see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have, have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought to, he ought not to live anymore. So, <laughs> so Festus is saying, hey, everybody, King of, listen. What's standing before you guys is a man that these people was all the way in Jerusalem trying to tell me to have this man killed. I ain't even seen this man. I haven't even heard this man. And they're trying to tell me to kill him there. So, of course, when I got here, I'm interested in finding out who is this guy. That may be people that have the deck stacked against you. They're trying to get someone to take you out before you even get to tell your part. But God tell you to hold your peace. I'm going to fight for you. At the appointed time, you shall get to speak. That's what God is telling you. At the appointed time, you're going to get to speak. And he's saying that this is what's taking place right here. He says, so these guys are, are sitting here and they're telling me to have this man killed. They're telling me to have this man killed even before I got here. Go ahead and kill him. Again, and Festus says, King of Ripple, and all, and all men which are here present with us, ye see this man. Paul standing there, about whom all of the all of the multitude of the Jews um, have have dealt with me. So he's saying, from everywhere, they all come in with the same story. Kill him. Okay, what makes this man so special? I, you know, he had my attention. If everybody's saying kill him, let me find out what makes him so special that they want him dead. Because he might need to die. But then again, he might be innocent. So you definitely have everybody's attention, even to the point to where Rome and the highest power in Israel, which is the king, all of them are standing there want to know, okay, what is it that makes this man so dangerous? What is it that makes him so dangerous? He's saying, and y'all guys from Jerusalem, all the way here to Caesarea, you guys are telling me to kill him, crying out, he ought not to live. Y'all are making the judgment. There are people that already pronounced death on you. They don't even want to give you a chance to be able to speak. That's your opinion, but I have mine too. And God has the final say in this thing. And so that's what, thank you, babe. So that's what you have right there in these situations. I'm not going to my brain. And so that's what you have in this situation. They saying, you know, he ought to be dead. Okay, why he ought to be dead? And when I'm asking y'all to tell me why he should be dead, y'all can't give me an answer. Y'all jumping over on some other things, but they was telling him without telling him. What was they telling him? They was letting him know. 
This is a spiritual matter. It's the battle. It's Jesus. That's what all of this thing, on your job, the problem you run into, the problem is really Jesus. Because you trust him, you believe Jesus, and you stand according to Jesus' word, and so therefore, you are a problem to the world. They want to make sure you don't offend nobody, but they make sure that you as a Christian is greatly offended. You can't defend this group, you can't talk about this group, you can't belittle this group, and you better be careful talking to another Christian, because if somebody overhear you talking and then offend them, we're going to come after you. Well, what about my offense? That's the question I'm asking. Everybody don't have to be, everybody can't be offended but the Christian. They say God everything, call God everything but God. But yet you have to eat it as a believer. But you say something about any particular group and they're ready to have you in HR and do a, 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 a write up on you. See, the devil don't want you at all to speak about your Jesus. And they get offended when you don't say nothing. When you just live right, because when you stand before God in righteousness, God says one thing you need to understand. When you stand before God in righteousness, you need to understand this thing right here. Your life is conviction. Your life is light. And sometimes people are offended just because your light is shining, which we are commanded in Matthew, the fifth chapter. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. But they don't want to glorify the Father which is in heaven. Your light condemns them. You could just be there minding your business. You see them do a thing and you just look at them. Oh, okay, Mr. Holier than thou. You act like you're perfect. You haven't said one mumbling word. But your life is condemning them. And that's what it should be. And so that's what we have here. And it's to the point they don't even want you around. They don't even want you to speak. And so what you have to do is stand firm according to God's word. What you have to do is just hear God. Hear God, guys. Two questions you should always have before the throne of grace. One, Lord, what am I to do? Two, Lord, how am I to do this? You need to find out what is it that God is asking of you. And you need to do exactly what God has asked you to do. He's never going to ask you to do something that you can't do. Your question is, Lord, how do I do this? How do I do it? The word says, if you lack wisdom, ask God. And the God that giveth, God giveth wisdom liberally would not get mad at you for asking. Now, here's my closing. I want to ask you this question. I have a question for you. Is the Jesus you serve still on the cross? Or is there a tomb? with a stone rolled away in your life. Where are you at? When people look at you, do they see the Jesus that you claim that lives? Have he changed you? Or is it that you have found yourself in such a state or a place to where people say there's no evidence that Jesus is alive in your life? Oh, saints, how bid it. Please let it not be that it is answered to us that way. That people say that about us, okay? Beloved, do what thus says the Lord. Honor God every step of the way. Know without a shadow of a doubt that God loves you. He is for you. And he will see you through this. Even when the most powerful people at that time is standing there looking at you. You just stay with God. He says, cast your cares upon me, for I care for you. If you're that scared on your job of your boss and people of authority and power, just cast those cares on God. For he careth for you. God loves you. God is for you. And God will see you through. Oh, Father, I pray that you bless the saints right here, right now. That they are able to look at the message tonight and ask themselves the question. Where do they stand with this? Are you alive in their life or are you still on the cross? Oh, Father, I desire to see less cross and more tombs, Lord God, with a boulder rolled away. We see the living God, not the one that died. Oh, Father, I pray that you bless us, that we stay firm on your word. Honor you, Lord, every step of the way. Bless the saints that the word that they heard tonight, that they are able to apply it to their lives, and that we may see the benefit thereof, that we may grow. Thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer. Now, I believe by faith that you have already honored this request, for I ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let me ask something. Are you one? Are you one that's out there 
who do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you've been existing, not living, and you have heard the message tonight and it has truly touched your heart, and you are saying, mm, mm, Lord, I hear your cry, and I want to answer it today. Are you one that do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and would like to know him as your Lord and Savior? If you are, I have good news for you. I want to walk you through God's plan of salvation. But before we move a step, let me ask this question. Is there someone out there? One that once knew Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you turned and walked away. And now you would like to be rededicated to Christ. I have good news for you too. We're going to walk you through God's plan of rededication. Come and walk with me with that person who have never known him. Just repeat after me. Say, Father, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you, Lord, for this door that is open before me. I take full advantage, Lord, of the opportunity that is before me and walk through this door by asking you, Jesus, to forgive me for the life of sin that I have been living. Forgive me, Lord, for living your life my way. I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life, sit on the throne of my heart, and I will serve you the rest of the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for accepting me. I right now, by my own free will, accept you, Jesus, as being my Lord and my Savior. I ask you, Lord, to rule this life, and I will serve you by free will the rest of the days of my life. Thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer. I believe by faith that you have honored this request in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of Almighty God. Welcome home. If you will put that down in the description section, guys, we would love to know about it, that we may be able to just share it with the saints. I mean it. Let us know. We will tell people in the comments. Put it in the comments. And we would tell people that. Now you may say, okay, now that I've gotten saved or I've given my life back to Christ, I'm not sure what to do now. When you get in a good Bible-believing church and sit down and let the word just fester in your life, you may say, well, I don't know. I'm not sure what, what truth is. So many churches all over the places. Well, just stay here with us and just continue growing in the word until you are strong enough to understand false doctrine from truth. And then you move forward and be in fellowship with the saints. Now you may say, well, I want to come to visit you guys. Where are you located? We are located at 1851 Highway 66 South in the city of Curtisville in the state of North Carolina. If you just Google that, we would love to see you. We would love to see you. We are a shaky, handy, huggy type of people. We are friendly people at Firm Foundation. You may say, okay, I want to come and visit you. I'm going to come and visit you. Okay, so, but what I want to do right now is I want to be a part of Firm Foundation. I like this ministry. How do you become a part of Firm Foundation? We ask you two questions. One, do you believe that the Bible is the true word of God? You say, well, yeah, I believe it. Okay, are you willing to obey the rules and the regulations of this ministry so as long as they line up with the word of God? You say, okay, if the Bible said and y'all said, okay, I'll, I'll go with that. Well, then we would say, welcome to Firm Foundation Outreach Ministry, a ministry that loves people right where they're at and work with them to get them to where God wants them to be. Now, you may say, I want to support the ministry. How do I go by supporting it? Well, you can go uh, right here on this page, and I'm going to tell you there's a QR code where you can give there, firmfoundationoutreach.org, you can give there, or you can go snail mail. Just mail it to Firm Foundation Outreach, uh, Firm Foundation Outreach located at 1851 Highway 66 South in the city of Kernersville, North Carolina. We need you to come join us, guys, right here on Sunday morning. We look forward to seeing you right here on this page, right here on this page, on this channel, Wednesday nights, 7 p.m., Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. Looking forward to seeing you here. We bless you in Jesus' name. Be blessed, saints.